blissful day in Gotham City. Hello. Ye- yes, I... Yes. Yes, I completely understand it has been some time since we've done a review episode here on the Bad Cape Podcast. Yes, yes, I know. I, I, I gave a promise at the beginning of the summer that I would follow a timeline, but then there were things that happened, and y- yes, yes, I, I... Look, I mean, we had the release of the trailer for the animated DVD. I had to talk about that. I managed to get Burt Ward on the show. Was I supposed to ignore Burt Ward so that I could review Minerva or the last Penguin episode? Really? Okay, 50th anniversary of the Green Hornet. I mean, the Hornet's sting is an important part of this whole thing. All right, maybe not an important... Well, I'm enjoying it with Jim Beard. And then there was Adam's birthday. I had to celebrate Adam's birthday. Yes, I did say I would do the review episodes over the course of the whole... But I'm going to... Yes, Mom. I promise I will get the show back on track. You too, citizen. Take care. Fans. What are you going to do about them? back citizens to an all new episode of the bat cave podcast it's your old bat chum john s drew here and we're coming to the final six this is it six more stories in the batman series to review and this is the first of them it's the final six it's penguins final story are the end here with burgess meredith although he will sort of make one more appearance penguin not burgess meredith in one more upcoming episode, you'll just see the back of him there and you'll hear the familiar wah wah as he's uh, hanging out with, uh, I think it's Dr. Cassandra and her assistant there at the state penitentiary. But, you know, I'm kind of sad to see this because, you know, the episodes have been a mix. We just did Nora Clavicle last week and that was a disaster, obviously. One of the worst episodes of the entire series. And I went into this episode with some mixed feelings because as a kid I remember not liking it but then as I'm watching it I'm finding some things to like and I'm hoping that my guest today agrees with me on these things or maybe can you know point out where I'm seeing things maybe too optimistically maybe I'm just being hopeful because it's the end of the series here joining me to discuss this final penguin episode is the author of Batman at 45, Mr. Chris Gould. Chris, welcome back to the podcast. Uh, welcome. Well, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> That's a nice welcome from you, John, and thank you for having me. Well, so I, you sent me your notes because you actually have been updating Batman at 45. And, you know, you and I, I, I at least just from just reading that and such, you and I seem to have different perspectives. So this is going to be an interesting discussion because you're not as positive and I didn't think I was going to be as positive. I'm not saying this is a great episode. This is by no means a great episode. But when you consider the third season, I'm finding this one to be a little better than some, which is sad to say, considering it's not that great. Sure, yeah. I think, um, you know, when I watched it again last week, uh, I guess... What I kind of ended up thinking was, yeah, given given that they hardly used any kind of gizmos or, or gadgets and it was a really cheaply done episode, mm-hmm. um, yeah, they, they managed to they managed to get a lot out of it on a limited budget. They I did. I, I agree with you on that. They managed to get a lot out of it on a limited budget. And I got to say, actually, that, and this is one thing, too, the sets for this one, considering it's a third season – they seem to put a little more effort into it. It's still pretty flimsy, but they hmm. they put a little bit more effort. It doesn't seem like it's just 
the black stage, although it is, with a few props in the background. They actually seem to put up some walls for some of these places and such, including in our opening scene, the, the Gotham Mint there. Yes, they did. Um, and I thought the uh, the hospital scene as well, at least it, it kind of remotely looked like a hospital. So um, I think given that we're comparing it, you know, uh, directly to the, the Nora Clavicle episode, which went before it, where the, the set was, I think, one of the one of TV's most you know unmitigated disasters. Um, yeah, I think this episode set stands up quite well when compared with that. Oh, my God. The pier scene. Oh, oh yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> Uh, thank, thank goodness you didn't ask me to do that one. <laughs> exactly. Oh, that was that one was a tough sell. I was lucky that Chris Franklin was like, "Well, I've never been on the show. What can I do?" And I'm like, uh, "Here you go." <laughs> well, uh, so let's talk about this episode. It's called Penguins Clean Sweep. It aired January twenty fifth. 1968 and like we said the show opens with penguin breaking and entering into the gotham city mint and as i say the set itself seems a little bit more elaborate it's definitely a much wider set there's a lot more uh, items in it and such because you know you've got the money making process going on and it seems it seems i say that something's going to happen i mean certainly penguin knocks out everybody with his gas and such and we see that he's asking Miss um, Broom, I think, or Miss... No, what was her name again? The the uh, mole. Um, Miss Clean. Miss Clean. Miss Clean, wasn't it? That's right. Miss yeah. Clean, he doesn't, he doesn't <laughs> refer to her very often by name. So it was a little... I, I couldn't remember for a moment there. Miss Clean. Um, yeah. You know, he asks her, you know, what would she like? And he tells her, oh, look, we got the, uh, the ink. We got the money. So uh, right there, it all looks obvious what, what Penguin's up to. And it seems that way when we then cut to Wayne Manor, where we get, oh, my goodness, it's the living room. And when Barbara told me she'd been elected chairman of the Gotham City anti-littering campaign... <laughs> Daddy arranged for this meeting with you, Bruce. Well, I'm glad he did, Barbara. Never hurts to remind anyone of the litter basket. Gosh, yes. A clean city is a healthy city. Then we can count on your support. Of course. A call for Commissioner Gordon, sir. Take it there. Oh, well, thank you, Alfred. Commissioner Gordon. <sighs> Terrible news, Chief O'Hara. Well, use the red phone and call Batman immediately. I'll hold on to this line. Anything serious, Commissioner? The penguin just been reported in the mint. Penguin in the mint? Yeah. That is serious. Oh, um, sir. This is perhaps an inopportune moment, but the, the downstairs hot water line has burst once again, and the shut-off valve seems to be rusted up. Yes, I'll give you a hand with it, Alfred. Would Thanks. you people excuse me? Yeah, surely, surely. Yes. It's the living right. The only time we see the living room in the third season. Really? It is. It's the only time, and it's a tight shot. It's very tight, so we don't go seeing the background with the, the uh, you know, with the outdoors, the, 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 doors leading to the deck or anything like that it's narrowed in on the fireplace and even then the walls look a little different than usual they've obviously just sort of hastily uh, cobbled a few things together and tried to desperately to recreate some of the magic of the first and second season maybe but um but yes you're referring to the scene where uh, the commissioner is is uh, happens to be at Wayne Manor at the moment the phone call is placed the is, phone is call that's placed and, and 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 like you said recreate the magic it's funny you say that because i feel this whole entire opening is trying to recreate that magic of the first and second season, not only with the view of the living room and such, but the fact that there's Barbara with Commissioner Gordon, and Gordon is all proud of the fact that Barbara has been named the chairman of the Gotham Anti-Litter Campaign. A, a little thing that kind of runs through this entire episode, the theme of cleanliness and, and, and the virus and the sickness that's going to happen and all, when he gets the call about penguin being at the mint and such so alfred has to come up with his little ruse to get bruce away about the burst pipe and all that so bruce slips away and and it's all there the only thing missing at the end is when bruce is talking to o'hara you know as batman and such and he mm. says we'll be right there we're just missing him and dick looking at each other and him saying to the bat poles. otherwise this is an opening of a first or second season episode 
Yes, it is. That's right, because I seem to remember that uh, in, in most of the third season episodes, when the call is placed to Wayne Manor, there's there's nobody there. Obviously, Aunt Harriet now is... Um, uh, her appearances have been limited due to ill health. So there's, there's absolutely no need for Alfred to, to make up any kind of ruse at all. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, and they're already in the study, so it's not like, you know... They got to rush anywhere and such. I mean, yes, there are some times where he does get to utter to the bat poles and such like that to, to Dick and such. But even then, it's not always that case. There's been a lot of openings, cold openings, where it takes place, you know, at Barbara's apartment or something else. And then we have to cut to credits. And then when we come back, they've already made their way back to Wayne Manor and are just emerging from the bat poles. So this was actually a nice little throwback to the first and second season. It certainly was. Mm -hmm. The two arrive at headquarters. And what's interesting is you would think they're going to go straight upstairs. We'll be we'll be right there in the office and and we'll get, you know, since we've already got this setting, we'll have them Mm -hmm. doing their little powwow and stuff. But no, the duo run right into Penguin as he and his goons are coming out of the elevator. Ah, The dynamic do-gooders. You've been helping old ladies across the street, Batman. (laughs) We're going to help you into a jail cell, you beaked buffoon. You leave my beak out of this, you baby barnacle. Let's get him back. No, no! Stop this loudish violence, you teenage truant. It offends my cultured soul. Which begs the question, because we haven't even gotten into the whole false arrest thing yet, because he hasn't arrested him yet. What is Penguin even doing in the building in the first place? <laughs> Unless he wanted to set all this up, and he timed it just so perfectly that Batman and Robin were arriving. Well, I'd, I'd love to believe that, uh, you know, the uh, the sort of fantastic planning that Penguin showed in seasons one and two uh, was on display again in season three and that this is all part of his clever ruse um, and, and not some kind of, you know, catastrophic cock up on the part of the scriptwriter. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But you know, but after after that point, I mean, I think the scene the scene does uh, you know provide some some mild entertainment, I guess. Oh yes, it does. No, I absolutely agree. And Batman is typical Batman because he takes Penguin and the goons up to Gordon's headquarters, has them you know for arrest and such, and Penguin tells him that he's going to sue for false arrest because he did nothing wrong, and. O'Hara's like, he's right. He stole nothing. We got nothing on him. But Batman turns the tables and says, what about the breaking and entering charge? We can nail him on that. And so because of it, Batman uses that to leverage himself out of the lawsuit Penguin's going to play and that, you know, they'll drop the charges. And that's typical Batman in a way, though, because it's like, all right, we're going to let him go because we're going to find out what this whole scheme is about. We could have (laughs) easily we could have easily arrested him. And, you know. He wouldn't have been in jail for very long, but let's let him go. Let's let him hang himself and we'll see what's going. And he's done that in the past. Exactly. And uh, I think in my in my latest notes, I, I pointed out that Batman does. Uh, he says something. We, ca- we can't hold Penguin for very long on, on such a minor charge. Uh, and I thought, well, you know, given given the amount of time, this, this is Penguin's 19th or 20th appearance in Batman. Um, given given the major crimes he's committed, you know, even when committing a major crime, they can't seem to hold him for too long. So, <laughs> you know, I think it's just a, it's just a flaw in the in the in the Gotham City um, penitentiary system. Full stop. I think. Um, but yeah, it, it, again, it's it's sort of evoking the the first season again. I think, isn't it? You know, that the criminal sort of um, is is seen sort of uh, you know entering some some building at the beginning of the episode and uh, ev- everything that they do is kind of part of some bigger riddle they don't they don't steal anything they don't, they don't damage anything uh, and it's all up to to uh, firstly to the police to say well should we arrest him and then Batman to say well no actually he hasn't committed a crime and, and and then it all leads into oh well let him let him you know play out his uh, his hand right and, uh, and hopefully we get a more exciting story hopefully. <laughs> Now, that, that's one thing, though, too. Didn't Catwoman once say whether she knocks over a hot dog cart or something like that or a bank, it doesn't make a difference for a 13-time loser like her? Wouldn't that be the same for Penguin? Couldn't they hope to hold him even longer because of his past based on you know what he's done, <laughs> even for the breaking and entering charge? That's right, because uh, there was... Was it, in, was it in the opening scene when... Uh, there's a point at which they talk about, you know, Penguin just being in the mint. 
Right. And and I think it's it's either Dick Grayson or Robin who says like, you know, oh, pe- penguin in the mint, you know, that, that must be catastrophic and terrible, you know. And there's, there's no suggestion that he's committed a crime or anything. But just as you said, you know, because he has that reputation, if that is the reputation that goes around with him, yes, surely they would at least have have some motivation to hold him for longer. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I don't know why they but there's little things like that that throughout this episode where you think whether it's based on precedent or whether it's based on uh, foreknowledge and such that certain things then don't work, and especially the very ending, which we'll get into. The very ending doesn't work for one colossal reason. We'll get into that. Batgirl arrives because obviously she knew what was going on because she was in mm. Bruce's uh, home as as, ba- as uh, Barbara there. So, and she reports on how the Mint employees are still sound asleep. Which I thought right. was interesting too. She's got that knowledge. Yes. Yeah. It's not. Uh, it's not. You know, O'Hara getting a call from the police or something. Batgirl brings this to them, so they decide to all head to the Mint, where Batman analyzes the banknotes. And I did like this. I always do like when Batman is the scientist. Whether the science is sound or not, I don't care. <laughs> I, I I like Batman the scientist with his little bat lab kit and all. Um, and he discovers that the money has been covered in Ligerian sleeping sickness brought on from the Ligerian fruit fly. And once again, this is something that annoys me about the third season. Robin's an idiot. Take a look, Robin. Looks like a bunch of miniature tadpoles, Batman. Batgirl. Bacteria. They seem to be of the species Somnophilia. Somnophilia Ligeria, to be exact, Batgirl. Ligerian sleeping sickness. Robin Mm. is a total idiot. It goes all the way back to the Riddler episode where Robin couldn't solve one of Riddler's riddles. Now here he is. He goes, Robin, what do you see here? He pushes it over. Robin looks and he goes, looks like tadpoles. It's like, really? Really, Robin? (laughs) I mean, even like just to say it looks like some sort of strain from this fly or Mm. something. Then he turns to Batgirl, the historian. Now, yes. remember, she's the historian. That's what she studied. Now, mind you, at the same time, also, she manages to put together a Batgirl cycle. She's got all this other stuff. She's got her own universal antidotes. So there must mm. be some science in her, too. She sees it right away. Yeah. You know? I yeah? Hate, I, mean, I hated that they, they yeah. sacrificed Robin's intelligence and gave it to That's Batgirl. Right. That's right. They, they, they took out all of his, uh, his good bits and, and just, uh, in, you know basically handed them on a plate to Batgirl, really. She, uh, I think I've, I've heard other people say that, you know, it, it was quite noticeable how, how much Robin's role diminished in season three. And um, he, might, he might as well just not have been there, really. Because, as you said, it sort of happened episode after episode, really. And um, not only was the, the, the quantity of his lines cut, but, but just, you know, the, the contributions that he made were just, um, well, yeah, to- totally out of keeping with a, with, a, with a guy who was nicknamed the Boy Wonder in seasons one and two. Exactly. Nicknamed the Boy Wonder, uh, basically a Batman in training. I think that's po- probably why many fans point to Whale of the Siren as probably one of the best of the third season, because mm. Robin gets to shine. I mean, Robin leads yeah. and Batgirl follows. Yes, exactly. It was one of the uh, the few uh, occasions on which Robin was trusted with uh, with carrying an episode. Uh, and that one, yes, I think he, he, he really carried it quite well. Uh, I never tire of watching that one. No, no, me either. So now that they know that the banknotes have been contaminated and money has mm. been sent out, they decide to split their forces. They send Batgirl to the bank to find out, you know, and stop the, the distribution of the money. And they themselves head to the hospital. And I do love the hospital scene. Like you said, it's one of the better sets. Penguin and himself are already there. They're getting double inoculated to make absolutely certain there's no chance. And keep that in mind. This is where the problem with the ending comes along. Um, They're double inoculated. And then he pours the rest of the vaccine down the drain as Batman and Robin arrive. You're not protected against a good right jab, you slimy bird. It's Betty Bye for you, Penguin. Nobody catches the penguin sleeping dynamic dreamers. Try this on for size. And Penguin releases three of the Ligerian flies as he makes his escape. The lethal Ligerian fruit fly. <laughs> Pleasant dreams, Batfink. <laughs> He's got to make sure those flies don't get out into the open. Look out, Robin. They are deadly. And I, I, I did like it. I like the whole thing with the bat swatter. Missed. They're too fast, Batman. 
What about the insecticide bat bomb? I left it in the Batmobile. But we dare not open that door mm. until all three of these flies are dead. Fortunately, I brought my all-purpose bat squad. And I thought it was interesting. You made note of this whole scene as well. But one thing you may want to add is, did you notice there was a moment of silence as each fly died? <laughs> You got one, Batman. Were, were, were the other two flies in, in, in a moment of shock Maybe. swatted away? You got another one. Well, it's one of those scenes, I think, where if I mean, you sort of watch it in the middle of uh, you know a whole stack of episodes, as I did the first time, you're kind of just thinking, my goodness, what, what, what on earth are they doing here? When I watched it, you know, on its own, with nothing else to compare it against. Um, no, actually, I thought, ah, yeah, you know, it's, it's quite fun to see, uh, to see these two guys oh, in really costume fun. again doing crazy things. And... Oh, perfectly still, this calls for the bat tweezers. I think I think it has some comedy value, yeah. Oh, it does. It definitely does. <laughs> One bite from this fruit fly, Robin, and you might have been asleep for years. Holy Rip Van Winkle! But this specimen might prove quite rewarding research-wise. The 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 last fly lands on Robin's nose, and suddenly the perspective of the size of the fly to the container that the three were in makes yeah. no sense at all because that fly is as big as the container yes <laughs> <laughs> he was he was obviously really itching to get out I guess. So. <laughs> yes uh and i did like the fact because as a kid i watched general hospital and the doctor there was played yes. by uh john uh berardino who played yes. steve hardy on general hospital for many years i was uh 70s 80s i was you know there for the luke and laura story the whole mm -hmm. when port charles was frozen by the con constant constantine constantine i forget the the the, okay. the 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 rich family that um john colicos played the head of and elizabeth taylor played his wife right yes well um you know i uh i don't know uh too much about uh, John Berardino's career. I just know that it was still in a, in a well, his acting career was still in the very early stage when he appeared on this episode. And I believe that the uh, General Hospital thing came about uh, four or five years after this was filmed, I think. Oh, no, no. He had been doing General Hospital already for a number of years. Had he really? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Had... So his, oh, yeah. his nominations came, his Emmy nominations came after. Oh, yeah, after yeah. That. Probably the Emmy nominations. But he was he was one of the early when when General Hospital first started on television, because I remember seeing black and white episodes with him. Right. Yeah, I see. Yeah. But I think as far as him being noticed by the Academy, yeah, that probably was later on down the line. Again, interesting, because when when uh, the first two or three minutes of the scene, he doesn't speak at all. That was the weird thing. I'm like, what is he doing? Why is he just, I mean, is that fear because he's afraid of Penguin? But he just kept nodding. And, so, and even Penguin's like, you know, say something, you know? At first, I just thought, I just thought he was going to be like the first, uh, you know, sort of um, visible, you know, non-speaking extra. Right. I thought, as you said, when, when Penguin and his goons leave and he's just left with Batman and Robin, that's when he suddenly opens up. Obviously, yes, uh, if, if he's uh, if he's well known on, on General Hospital, he has to play a doctor, mm -hmm. of course. But uh, and then, yeah, I guess if, if he's well known, he has to have, uh, you know, at least a bit of a speaking part. Sure. Um, so he, he sort of dramatically comes to life after all the flies have been uh, captured provides uh, some minor exposition, I think, to move the plot along. Yes, he does. Well, he, he informs Batman it's going to take 24 hours to get, you know, more of the vaccine. But with the vaccine, yes. Yeah. Mm. So so they, 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 you know, Batman tells him, just get it here as soon as possible. And, and they run off to the bank. And at the bank, we discover that money has already been distributed, you know. Um, and again, yeah. this set isn't all that bad. For, for a yeah. quick scene, this is not a bad looking set. Yeah, probably just a, almost like a knee-jerk reaction to the previous week's episode, I guess. So, exactly. Um, you know, exactly. Hold on to them. Yeah. yeah. I, I almost wonder if it was almost like, well, Burgess is coming on, we'll make the set a little bit more. Although then I think about it, they bring Frank Gorshin back and they give him that god-awful gym, which was just the back black drop with, with a few props. So, I don't know. It just, it's weird. It's weird that this had a little more thought put into it. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, I not mean, it's not perfect. I, again, not by any stretch of the imagination. I'm thinking if this was an equivalent first or second season episode, the set design yeah. would be even better. But still, for what it is for third season, mm. it stands out as something a little better. Yeah, it does. I think there's um, there's definitely something in what you said about, you know, sort of um, dressing it up a bit for, for someone of Burgess Meredith's stature when he comes on set. Um, I think the, uh, the horse riding adventure uh, also was... Uh, 
more creative than usual. Yes, I agree. That's it. Um, with Frank Gorshin, I think uh, he was probably not on uh, as good terms with the Batman producers as Burgess Meredith was, um, because Burgess had stayed loyal during season two, and, and Frank apparently uh, wanted a pay rise. And uh, I think that uh, may have riled a couple of people. Maybe. So it uh, it may just have been their way of uh, showing him who was boss by saying, well, you know, you you may think you're bigger than the show, but, you know, yeah. you, you you're not big enough to get a decent set kind of thing. Right. That That's very possible. And and so Batman is like, okay, we need to send out a warning to all the media. Let them know that, you know, there is contaminated money and, and people should not be touching their money and such. The, the warning, though, is so vague because it's like it just sounds like your money could be contaminated. Don't touch it. Uh, even even Gordon actually finds it a bit drastic, but he does it anyway because Batman tells him to. Hey, well, uh, you know, this this was a guy who uh, who, you know, won the election for city mayor. So I guess he, he commands the trust of the citizens. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you're right. I mean, the, the, there's the scene where the um, two youngsters are walking in the street with that big radio and they hear the announcements. We interrupt our music to bring you a special bulletin. Some of the money in Gotham City has been infected with a deadly tropical disease. Any contact with money now circulating in Gotham City may be extremely dangerous. The announcement itself doesn't seem convincing enough for them just to immediately tip all of their money onto the road. Um, <laughs> but, you know, the citizens of Gotham, everything's black and white for them, you know, just take no chances. If there's if there's a hint that something might be tampered with, you know, just, just discard it, you know. Yeah, that's true. That's I, I like that, black and white. <laughs> It really is, isn't it? You know, there's no in between. So before we before we know it, the, the whole city has just discarded every every bill of money that it holds. Yeah. The... Yeah. I, I liked yeah. also that you noted I completely missed it. I don't know why I missed it, because I actually kind of liked it was the the surfing music that the, the kids are playing on yeah. their big radio. Well, uh, yeah, it it, uh, it appeared again in, in the in the three bells in, in, in London or Londinium. And then it, uh, it came back again here as well. So right. um, it did. Oh. Um, I mean, I, I, I personally, I, I don't know whether it's just because it's forever tied to the, to the surfing scene in my mind, but it, it's obviously the most, um, for me, it's the most memorable track from the third season. Um, I quite like the feel of it. I think it's got a nice groove to it. I think it captures the spirit of the time. Uh, and uh, it, uh, yeah, it kind of uh, gives you a bit of a feel-good factor, you know, when you watch these scenes. But also probably hints at uh, the, the speed at which Billy May had to compose all this stuff after after Nelson Riddle, I think, uh, left quite hurriedly at the end of season two. Hmm. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, there's there's a number of reasons as to why that piece could have been uh, reused over over and over again. But I, I, yeah, I, I quite enjoyed it. Yeah, no, I did too. I did too. And I, I'd forgotten also that they did use it in the Londinium episodes too as well. Yeah. Um so Penguin takes advantage of all this money being ditched by the people of Gotham and all over. Even the crooks are, are returning money to the bank after they just stole it when they get the warning and such. He's coming through the streets with, with sweepers, gathering up the money. And again, this is another little weird scene that doesn't make any sense. Batgirl arrives. She's quickly captured and knocked out. And Penguin, rather than doing something with her just leaves her on the side there of the sidewalk and heads off because he's got to collect his money as he, he right. you know leaves at the end of Act 1. And we get that song. And I was trying to see if I could find any connection, like what the song was a parody of and such, but I couldn't find mm. anything. No, uh, I, I couldn't find anything either. But I think, yes, I, I too was kind of um, more preoccupied with, you know, given the history between Penguin yes. and Batgirl in, in, in both of her... Uh, personas i mean it, it just beggars belief that he just said oh, i haven't got time to deal with her you know i'm just gonna go sweep up money <sighs> yeah it, it was um i felt you know given given the amount of time left in the episode they, they could have worked a little trap in there just to you know just to uh uh how can i say well you know change the tempo change the pace of it Right. No, I agree. I totally agree. And I'd forgotten about that. They have a history. So it's like, you know, here's here's someone who did me wrong. Yeah, just leave her by the side of the road. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, um, he, I, yeah, I mean, as I said, I think uh, a lot of the um, 
a lot of the third season scripts uh, just just tend to sort of uh, ramble on, I suppose. And uh, who who knows what what scenes were cut in the process of making this episode? Maybe maybe the original plan was to have her in a trap, and then they just went, oh, we we, we got to cut something somewhere, and they they cut three pages. I mean, who who knows? Right, right. Now I do like this opening to the second act here, where Bruce starts making phone calls to his fellow financiers and warns them about the infected money. And I forgot Mm -hmm. for a moment as I'm watching the scene, because, you know, we're so used to today that when you used to have to make long distance calls, a lot of times you had to raise your voice. Hello, Ibn Muktash. This is Bruce Wayne. No, no, it's not about my oil interests. I called to tell you that the currency here in Gotham City is infected with a dangerous disease. I want to warn you against accepting any of it for the next few days. You're quite welcome. You might pass the information on to the other financiers in your area of the world. Yes, goodbye, Eben. Is that, uh... Carpathia. Thank you. Hello. Hello, Mr. Bolescu. Yes, that's right. That's right. And uh, it's not it's not so often that we, we, we hear uh, Bruce Wayne speaking in a raised voice. Uh, probably the, the one time that sticks out is when the, the, the uh, you know, King Tut dresses up as the mummy and, the, and Bruce Wayne has to yell for a doctor in the house. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, but yeah, it's, it's quite it, it makes for a nice, uh, you know, entertaining change to, to see Bruce really kind of, uh, you know, giving it some over the phone. Um, he he tends to lose uh, a lot of the um, sort of uh, sort of suave sophistication that he normally portrays. Right, exactly. Yeah, and and not realizing it at the time as I'm watching that scene, it's more than just simply Bruce warning his financiers because you know they all deal with money and such. But he does have a plan that we find out afterwards because Penguin at his hideout tries to buy a country in order to put a house in. And he realizes that he can't because nobody will touch his money. Yes, indeed. Uh, you know, as as far as um, season three plots go, that's uh, a, a little bit of a nice twist, uh, a little bit of a, a thought behind uh, uh, behind someone's action, and um, yeah, adds, adds a, a, a slight element of depth to what's going on. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. We get back to the Batcave. And Batman is continuing to examine the fly. He's got Alfred working the weather station, trying to figure out what the weather forecast is like for the day. And he gets a call from Penguin to Bruce Wayne. Penguin threatens to release 500 fruit flies unless Bruce tells everyone the money is good. And Bruce says he won't. Um, So Penguin goes through with his threat. He goes over and he gets, and I like the way you noted this. I completely didn't really catch this. The, uh, the box of 500 fruit flies clearly marked as though he purchased them, you know, like that. (laughs) Is that from, from a catalog or something? Yeah. I totally missed that. And again, though, but considering the size of the fly on Robin's nose earlier, I can't believe 500 flies are in that box. Maybe it was a mislabeled box. I don't. I don't know. Maybe. Um, yeah. I mean, if they have, a, if they have a pack of 500, they got to have a, you know, a pack of 100 or maybe even 50 or something, right? I mean, you know, right. Uh, they, they must have given a bulk discount or something. But um, yeah, you know, again, a nice, uh, a nice little comic touch, which you, you know, I, I, I missed the first time, but then just when, you know, I was paying a bit more attention to it. I thought, oh, yeah, funny. <laughs> yeah. And and I do like, actually, because Penguin has sort of, not, not that it was a backup plan to begin with, but it's sort of his consolation. He's like, okay, fine. I can't use the money. I'll knock everybody out in Gotham City, and I'll just strip the city clean of all its jewels and loot. And this way, I'll at least have something to, to for, for my troubles. Which is fine. But then you, you kind of think, well, you know, at, at which point did he did he get hold of the 500 flies? Because... You know, why why would he only have released three in the earlier scene when he could have totally, you know, tied Batman up with, with 500? I guess, yeah. Batman would have had to have taken so much time to kill them all that Penguin could have just robbed all the banks and, and you know, escaped. and <laughs> Yeah. To, to yeah. his secret Pelican Island hideaway or wherever he goes. Yeah. <laughs> And, and and from this point on, the episode sort of rushes through to the end there. Batman calls Gordon, and Batgirl is there in the office when 
uh, Gordon gets the call. He wants them all to meet him at Gotham National Bank. We cut to the bank. It's outdoors. And it looks like everyone has succumbed to the sleeping sickness. When Penguin arrives, he's stepping over them and such. Sleeping like babies, and even this mutton headed police chief. Of course, he looks like he's sleeping even when he's awake. Ah, <laughs> oh, watch! This is no more than I deserve. A very fine watch. You yeah, won't be needing a watch where you're going. What? You'll need a calendar. A 20 year calendar. This is impossible! You're all infected with Nigerian sleeping sickness! Oh, you see, that's what happens, Pinky Poo, when you send out a fly to do a man's job. That's right, Pinky Poo. We're just sleepwalking. What do you say to a little sleep fighting, Robin? Huh. Good idea, Bat Girl. Get him, Pink! Get him! We'll handle this. And a bat fight breaks out. And you noted this, too, about how this is one of those few times when, you know, Batman's sort of like, you know, we'll take care of this, everybody scatter. But I noticed that, I don't know, it, it always s- seems strange to me. That was ADR, that, that when he says that, that's voiceover. That's not actually yes. happening there. The True. gestures he makes as he's saying it don't seem to fit the line. It just, it just comes out of nowhere, and it's so obvious that the ADR is just roped in there. Usually the line preceding a fight was ADR. I, I remember a, a few instances from season two, especially with Robin saying, you know, you know, it must be a trap, or it is a trap, or something like that. And it was pretty poorly, poorly overdubbed. There have been occasions before where, you know, O'Hara and uh, Gordon have been right in the vicinity of a bat fight, and it's, it's just kind of unspoken. It's just assumed that, you know, Batman and Robin will just, uh, will just go on and do the business, and the police can just stand and watch. No! Take your fumbling fingers off my person! Batman! You use a foul trick to murder those innocent fruit flies! You murdered them, Penguin, when you let them out. My recent research on Ligerian fruit flies has proved conclusively that Gotham City's 45 degree temperature has caused an inversion of air layers. Which in turn raised the atmospheric pressure and crushed the flies to death. That's right, Batgirl. I've been tricked! You tricked yourself, Penguin, just as you did when you had that doctor give you a double dose of B6 vaccine. So large a dose, you'll probably contract Ligerian sleeping sickness yourself. And me? <laughs> well, you stopped the penguin cold, Batman. Cold indeed. <laughs> How did you know it would be cold? I consulted a very reliable weather forecaster, Commissioner, who predicted that today would be clear and cool. Well, he was certainly right about it being cool, but those clouds up there don't look very clear. After all, even the best of weathermen is entitled to an occasional miss. I thought it was just a little odd. Usually when the fight breaks out, it's because the villain says, get them before they get us or something to that effect. This Mm. time, there's Robin making some sort of a comment and then Batgirl goes, how about we fight now? And I'm like going what like (laughs) how about you've got the commissioner the chief of police batman robin and batgirl you just all get your handcuffs out and say okay and then maybe they'll say all right let's take him out we 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 got nothing to lose but no batgirl's like let's fight and it's like okay (laughs) (laughs) yeah um you know she 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 has attitude she's supremely confident um (laughs) And well, of course, she she has a history with Penguin as well, doesn't she? So she may she may have extra incentive to, to stick one on him, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, the fight was fine itself. I noticed yeah. that as we're getting towards the end here, they're getting a little heavy with the uh, title card effects for each yeah. hit. It's almost like at the end of the Six Million Dollar Man Bionic Woman run as well, where everything required a bionic sound effect. Now everything requires a, a title card effect for every little kick or punch. Sure, yeah. Um, I, I can only assume that they were uh, they were preparing for that, uh, that uh, absolutely appalling scene in the, in the second from last episode where, you know, it... Everything takes place in darkness, and it's just <laughs> it's just punch cards the whole way through. <laughs> maybe maybe this episode was a trial run. Maybe I don't know. Maybe maybe that's yeah. true. Yeah, because you got it. You got it. Sort of like uh, you know, vary that scene up with the darkness with some with some of the bi- title cards. Wow. In, in, 
Yeah. Um, but but you're right. They, they they are just they are just overusing it. I mean, I, I I've never timed the the fight scenes, but I imagine that they're all pretty short in season three, and uh, you know the, the the gap between fight cards also has has shortened. And um, yeah, sometimes it's uh, it's a bit annoying because you just can't really see what's happening in the fight, really. But there we go. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I, I it particularly stood out to me when Batgirl was up on the. I guess that's a newsstand it was supposed to be the the colored thing there. She's and she's just kicking yeah. away and every single kick just earned a title card. Sure, sure. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um yeah, they they were particularly overused when she was standing on something like a table or whatever. So, yeah, but right. um you know, I guess that's why a lot of people accused her of uh, you know, sort of scene stealing in in season 3 really. Mm-hmm. Um the, those the, the the overuse of the fight cards literally meant you couldn't see anything. Now, here's something where I know we're supposed to, because the kids look forward to it, is the bat fight. But as you mentioned, maybe if we'd had the trap, we could have cut this whole entire scene much shorter. Because the very end, there's Batman explaining, you know, that the fruit flies were crushed due to the change in air pressure from where they Mm -hmm. were to where they are now. Which, again, fine. Science, I don't care. It's, It's fine. But then he also tells Penguin, you took a double dose of the vaccine, which basically induced the sleeping sickness and should be hitting you right about now. I think, honest to goodness, we could have had the trap. We could have had a little bit more story there. The very ending, forget the fight. They could have been about ready to fight when Batman would just stand there confidently and like Robin would be like, aren't you going to like get poised or get ready and stuff? No. And just watch them drop like flies and forget the bat fight for this one episode oh yes absolutely and and how about this that they they could have just uh, tied it into uh you know penguin's opportunity to uh, kidnap batgirl earlier right. you know he he could have kidnapped her he could have actually been on the verge of of succeeding in his in his plot and then suddenly yes the you know the sleeping sickness kicks in just as he's about to deliver the, the hammer blow and and it could have been quite a dramatic escape, couldn't it? Really? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. They missed they missed an opportunity there, and that's the one thing I I, I you know was like wow because there's Batman feeling so confident. I'm like, well then why did you even fight them? Why did you even risk anything? It's just you knew that that was going to kick in at any time there. I don't know. But and then and then the very ending, as Batman is like, well you know we predicted that the weather was going to be cool, and then suddenly the rain starts and the storm comes in. And oh, Alfred talking right to the audience, apologizing for the 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 miss uh, forecast. Mm. I I hate when the characters talk to the audience. I just hate it. Yeah, yeah. I think you know, as as you said. I mean, there's so much more that they could have done with the with, with the previous scene. Um, you know, I, I can't believe that with with all of these you know potential uh, plot lines that they could have followed, and they actually ended up with with you know not enough footage being shot and they had to put that scene in as an extra um yeah quite quite a disappointing way to to end the episode really Mm -hmm. well when you consider also just i know that you know this is supposed to be comedic you know the the whole Mm -hmm. idea of the comedy is that these people actually believe that these absurd events occur and they do it all with the straight face and and this is life in gotham city we laugh at them we laugh you know at what's going on they just take it at face value to me every time you turn to the camera it's like we get it audience we're in on the joke too and i i just that shatters the illusion of gotham city then all of a sudden yes it it does and i Again, I, I, I think we'll find now, because we're into the last, uh, you know, six or seven episodes, this tends to happen more. Um, this is right round about the time that the producers knew the show was being cancelled. And there's a lot more uh, self-parody. Uh, there's a lot more things that the producers want the audience to see. And, yeah, as you said, you know, they, they, they want the viewers to, to think, oh, you know, even... Even these guys know how ridiculous it is. Even these guys are in on it. Um, and I think especially sort of in, in episodes 119, 120, um, you know, it, it, that, that really comes to the fore. Right. And Alfred's, Alfred's scene, you know, his, uh, his uh, sort of um, monologue to, to the camera um, could, could well have been the start of that, really. Yeah. 
Yeah. All right. So let's just talk really quick about a couple of the elements here, starting with the penguin. I mean, I, I think you mentioned in your notes 19 appearances altogether. Yes, I believe that's right. That makes him joint top along with uh, Cesar Romero's Joker. Right. Now, to me, you know, they, they did nothing new with the character here. He's he's still the Penguin. My only actual qualm about his appearance in this episode is that I felt he didn't get enough to do. I felt we didn't get enough to, of Burgess Meredith except for the very end. Yeah, that's right. Um, I think, uh, yeah, especially with the villains who had, had been with the show since the beginning. Um, we mentioned the Gaussian episode already, uh, you know, teaming Cesar Romero up with, uh, with other kit for Catwoman. Yeah. I, I just felt that all of the, uh, the big three who remained really had their parts diminished in season three. And, um, in, in general, um, for the, uh, for the villains that had carried the show from the start, I, I thought they had a disappointing amount of screen time. Yeah. And, and same for Burgess Meredith here. Yeah. Yeah, I would I would definitely agree with that. Um, our goons, we do get names for them: Dustbin and Pushbroom. Which, oddly enough, this time the names are connected to the caper and not to the penguin himself, which is usually the case. They're they're more connected to. Actually, that's not true. I shouldn't say that because if I remember correctly, the penguin episode where he opens the restaurant, he had Cordy Blue. <laughs> and uh, uh, some somebody else said so that their names were also connected to the caper. Now that I just realized that. Yeah, sure. Um, well, yeah, I think uh, the, the third season in general was um, was much more about the, the topics rather than the villains. So uh, and, and I think that was reflected even in the names of the henchmen this time around. Right. Right. And, and there was Miss Clean uh, played <laughs> by Monique Van Voren, who you yes. noted still alive. At the age of ninety-one, is of this recording. Indeed, uh, you know if you're if you're uh, a couple of episodes uh, short at the end of the run, you might want to try to track her down and get her on. Well, well, uh, guess what? I found her on Facebook. Oh my goodness! She has a Facebook page, so I sent her a friend request. We'll see, because um, yeah, I'm I'm trying to see if I can start lining up. I just recently friended Edie Williams on Facebook, so I'm hoping to get her on the podcast as well. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean, amazing. 91. It's funny because, you know, a lot of Bat fans lament the fact that many of the folks who worked on the show aren't with us. And there there are a number who aren't. But if you actually look, there are still quite a few, especially the malls, are still among us. Yes. Fran Francine York has a, has a huge, uh, you know, following and such on Facebook herself there. She does indeed, and uh, it's it's been very nice to see uh, Diane McBain being very active on the Batman sixty six fan page as well. Yes. Um, so yeah, I, 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 and I think Do Donna Loren signed up recently as well. Yes, she did. She did. Yes, she did. So you're right. I mean, the 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 moles, uh, d despite all the um, you know daring risks that they took in the series, uh, have uh, you know managed to to live very long and healthy lives, haven't they? Very long and healthy lives, and if you ever see their pictures, they're all still quite attractive and stunning for their age yes indeed you know? exactly uh, so i think uh yeah they obviously uh uh you know they, they, they their beauty was obviously noticed by the, uh, the the casting directors at the time and it's it's stayed with them through the years so fantastic yeah yeah, yeah. um back gadget did you have a favorite um well the only one i even noted i think was the the, the fly swat right um which uh yeah I mean, it was it was nice that they they shaped it like a bat, and uh, I, I presume that the the wings of the bat can kind of sort of de deliver a devastating strike to the Nigerian <laughs> fruit fly. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I like the fly swatter myself. I also liked the 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 telescoping arm of it, so that he's able to extend it as far as he <laughs> needs. <laughs> well, there we go. Yeah. Well, considering the fact that in this third season, they really didn't introduce a lot of new gadgets. It was pretty cool. Yes, it was. I think, you know, going back to what we said at the very start of this podcast, you know, getting a lot out of a limited budget, you know. Uh, the first time you see that fly swatter, you just think, oh, here we go, you know, more budget cuts again. But when you actually look at what they did with it and, and, and the fact that, I, I, you know, you, you laugh a couple of times when Batman uses it, 
and 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 the uh, you know the, the the way that his face becomes this very sort of stern <laughs> mask of concentration while he uses it. Yeah, I mean that, that's funny stuff. So yeah, yeah, um, it's it's a pretty good gadget as far as season three goes. Yeah, I think I agree. I agree with that. Um, the trivia question from Joel Eisner's official Batman Bat book. I. I mm didn't allude to it earlier other than the fact that the money got out how much of the contaminated money was distributed according to batgirl oh my goodness um no i i've forgotten what she said so uh, okay i'm relying on you here uh yeah. 13,000 13,000 13,000 yep and and it's funny because then Batman, I, I love this. Batman says, "Who did you give it to?" And you know the bank manager's like, "Well, it it went out. You know, we just handed out money. <laughs> yeah, it's like we don't keep track of who takes what money and such like that in terms of, you know, the notes and such. I mean, I'm sure they have a record of this one withdrew X amount of dollars or this one cashed a check, yeah. but you know they don't keep track of that kind of thing. So I thought that was an interesting or or an odd question to ask. Who did you give it to? You know. Um, yes, in, indeed. Um, yeah, I, 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 again, I, I kind of feel that a lot of these lines were, were kind of, they, they wouldn't have made it into to season one or, or season two, I think. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, the directors and, and, the, and the writers, and, and certainly given, given how many episodes Oscar Rudolph was directing in season three, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if he just thought, my goodness, can, can we just try something different here? You know, can you just throw in a crazy line or something just to break up the, break up the monotony or something like that. <laughs> All right, so let me ask you, you're Robin the Boy Wonder. And you're smarter than he is in the third season. And you've, <laughs> ju you've just finished watching this episode and you turn to Batman. And how would you sum up your feelings about this episode in a holy exclamation? Holy bumpy road ahead. Ah, okay. And yeah. not just this episode, but you're talking about the episodes forthcoming. Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's easy. It's easy to say, you know, having watched them, um, I mean, yeah, okay, if, if Boy Wonder was, was summing this episode up without having knowledge of the, the future six episodes, um, well, I don't know how he'd sum it up, to be honest. Um, but I think, you know, given that the, the Nora Clavicle one turned out the way that it did and, and basically just put, put the bar so low that now pretty much anything will go. Right. Um, and and given, given the self-parody that was evident in this one, Alfred breaking the fourth wall, that kind of thing, you know, if there if there's a chance that the that the episodes to come will you know overuse some of the, the the bad things that have been going on in in this episode, then you're sort of thinking, yeah, I mean, we've had a great run for the past two years, but this is really quite a quite an ignominious way to end. Yeah, yeah. I, I gotta say though, despite all that, I gotta say, holy payoff. I, okay. I kind of like this one. I, honest to God, I didn't think I would. I even seem to recall hmm. as a kid not liking it. But yeah. in watching it now, it's not all bad. There's, there, is, there is somewhat of a story here. Many of the plot elements do fit into place. There are some that we, yeah, as we've discussed, we, we're scratching our heads and going, what? But there, there's just something here. And yeah, you're saying Bumpy Road Ahead. I'm, I'm going to try because I got to because I'm hosting this mm. thing. Uh, I'm going to try and be a little more hopeful as we move into the final five uh, stories for this season. Because all that's left is Shane, King Tut, mm. Joker, Cassandra, Dr. Cassandra, and Minerva. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, I think uh, the, the King Tut one was pretty good right and i'm sure you'll have a very exciting time discussing that one um the shame one yeah i think for some of the the one-liners in there um yeah it's it's better than quite a few season three episodes uh dr cassandra and, and joker's flying saucer uh, <laughs> well i you know I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna say to the to the uh, to the listeners out there you know i'm, I'm sure that whichever guest john has on and i'm, I'm sure that john himself will uh, will make it a very entertaining show for you <laughs> yeah <laughs> hey, when I started the podcast all the way at the beginning and I did like the first couple of episodes, you know, I, I in particular the Joker, the very first Joker episode, which is still to to me my favorite 
I actually mm. pref- I prefer the Joker story, the first one with the the uh, stolen cruise liner and such, and what's my crime? I prefer that over the Riddler. I, I and I admit the Riddler is a very good one, the very first the pilot episode is very good, but I prefer the Joker one. And I remember saying that this is as good as it gets as far as I'm concerned. And then I'm like telling people, but don't worry, you know, listen on. We're, we're going to have a good time. So, I'm, I, yeah, it's the same thing here. We got five more to go, folks. I mean, if anything, you know, if it's as bad as it is, you, maybe you want to listen to the train wreck. I don't know. Oh, God. I'm not I'm not selling this very well. <laughs> no, no, I think, you know, actually, okay, I, I've got to, I've got to, qualify what i what i what i said earlier about you know robin's summary of things because there is there is light at the end of the tunnel that you know okay the the nora clavicle run for, for me sort of represented the the nadir and there are a couple of episodes coming up which if you had if you had watched them without knowledge of nora clavicle you might not be too impressed with them but compared to nora clavicle you might be pleasantly surprised <laughs> there you go <laughs> Oh, so Chris, thank you very much for agreeing to be on this episode here, even though this wasn't one of the better, better ones. It still was a fairly decent one. As far as Batman at 45, uh, I I mean, I'm going to be putting links, but is there anything like in the way of a website or anything that people can go to to learn more about the book? Ah, there was a website about two years ago, and uh, I used to be quite active on it, and I used to you know, blog in the style of the villains and the style of Bruce Wayne. And that was, that was really funny. Actually, I quite enjoyed that. Um, but unfortunately the, um, the website was costing quite a bit to run. Mm. So uh, I, I, I've taken it down for the time being. Um, but, uh, you know, if I, uh, if my work situation dramatically improves and I, I have a few dollars to spend, I'll, uh, I'll put it back up and, uh, you know, you guys can check it out. Um, but for the moment, uh, no website, I'm afraid. Okay. All right. Well, as I say, you can definitely get, though, I'll have links up in the show notes so that people can get uh, their copy of Batman at 45. And as we've discussed in the past, I mean, this is definitely uh, a work that, you know, Batman fans should have. I mean, we all, we all go to and refer to Joel Eisner's book, and it's a great book and all. But you really, in terms of helping us to remember what it is about the show, because it wasn't just the campiness. It wasn't just, you know, I mean, you certainly talk about all that and the the humor and such, but you also remind us of just how, in terms of who appeared in this show, and it creates the perfect time capsule in terms of encapsulating what this show meant at the time that it was on. Well, that was the, uh, that was the main message that I, intended to give really uh, this this whole idea of this this snapshot of mid to late 60s American popular culture. Uh, I've tried to get as much of it down in the book as I can. I'm pleased to say that uh, some fans have uh, have contacted me and they said, why don't you look at this? Why don't you look at that? Uh, you know, this point that you raised here, maybe maybe it's not quite right. Maybe you should change it. Um, so it, it's, it's been a really interactive experience. Uh, I've made a, a few new acquaintances because of it. And um, and because it's all digital now, it's, it's always a work in progress. Whenever I have a two or three days spare, as I, as I did during the winter vacation, I'll always sort of sit down, try and add some new stuff. Um, and it will just keep growing and growing, I'm sure. Very nice. Very nice. Well, Chris, once again, thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. So, folks, tune in next time as we discussed here. Shame is back. Now, I haven't watched it. I've made it a point not to go ahead and watch any of the remaining episodes until it's time to review them. Is he going to suffer the same fate as many of our villains as we've discussed here, including our core uh, trio or co- uh, four of the main villains is he going to suffer the same fate in this outing uh, as I'm joined in the discussion once again by the Hunic Outcast so until next time folks thank you so much for listening once again citizens Chris everyone take care everybody thanks for listening chums I don't have a bat phone but you can contact the Bat Cave podcast through its Facebook page Twitter, email at thebatcavepodcast at gmail.com or by phone at 888-866-9010. Subscribe to the podcast via Lipson.com. That's L-I-B-S-Y-N dot com or through iTunes. The Batcave Podcast is part of a series of pop culture podcasts from the Chronic Rift Network. Find them at chronicrift.com. 
So until next time, citizens, same bat time, same bat cave podcast. <laughs>